Months ago, I sat down to write a simple, clean, clear essay about lay Zen practice. It was low hanging fruit. The thing was teed up. All I had to do was talk about what I do as a guy who used to be a Zen Buddhist monk full time, now living in the world. Easy, right? Wrong. I'm still working on that piece. And I'm going to put it up on Patreon at some point. But it turned out to be a lot harder than I thought. When I was a monk, I knew who I was. Every morning, I put on my, my karomo, my hakama, and I put on my, my rukasu. Then I tied my monk's belt or my osho priest's belt later on over that. I was geared up. I had my costume on. I knew who I was. It put me in a certain frame of mind. I went up to the zendo. I had to drink tea. I had to sit a certain way. I had to be manifesting stillness and silence. And that practice day after day after day told me who I was. It held me in place. It supported me spiritually. I don't have that anymore. I don't have robes telling me who I am. I don't have a form or a structure telling me what to do or how to be. And this, I think, is the hardest part about having a lay practice. You never quite know what you're supposed to be doing or how you're supposed to do it or who you really are as a lay Zen practitioner. You always feel a little bit like you're making it up as you go along and that's okay. <laughs> I've begun to realize that's okay. That's a lay practice. It's an adventure. In Japan, they used to have, I think they were called shugyoso. Shugyoso. Shugyo means like practice. Shugyoso was like a wandering samurai. So there was this period in a samurai's life when they had no daimyo. They had no uh, warlord that they were under, that they were serving. There was a period when they just wandered. And they samurai, and they got into all these like fights and adventures outside of the protection of their warlord. They were basing this, these wandering samurai, on the on the Zen Buddhist monks who had a period of wandering as well. I think they called it the, I forget what they called it. I'll put it, I'll put it down below. And it was a period of wandering. It was a period where the monk didn't have a firm teacher that he was studying under or a monastery where he was rooted in. Rather, he was wandering across the countryside and going from monastery to monastery and doing Dharma combat with different teachers and Dharma practice with different monks. And it was an incredibly fertile, rich, dynamic time in this monk's life after he'd done his serious chicken monk unsui training and before he really settled in and became a full-time monastic or a teacher, that sort of thing. There was this period of wandering and I've come to think of this time in my life after living at a monastery for 13 years, this lay monk's period in my life is like my time as a wandering monk. That's what lay practice is. You're living the life of a wandering monk. And as a wandering monk, you are going to practice spontaneously. You are going to be making it up a little bit as you go along. And this is beautiful, good, and right in how it should be. I want to emphasize that. So take a deep breath if you find yourself practicing alone, feeling like there's nobody there to support you. Even if you have a community that you sit with, you still gotta leave them at the end of the day. You still gotta come home to your family, your life, your job. So you probably feel a bit unmoored from a, a solid, firm, rooted spiritual situation. And I'm here to tell you that's good. It's only because you're a wandering monk. Congratulations. We're practitioners on the road. It's called the path. So all that being said, I found that there are basically like three tools in my lay practice toolkit. So they are meditation or zazen, 
contemplation and mentorship or spiritual friendship. Let's start with contemplation. Contemplation can take many different forms and I don't always do it, but I try like once a week, at least a few times a month to spend an afternoon diving deeply into spiritual texts that I'm familiar with, that I've made friends with, and that I want to, to absorb on a much deeper level. So when I was at the monastery, there were a bunch of, of recorded shows or Dharma talks that my teacher had made. And at one point we transcribed a bunch of them and we put them in this special folder and we put them in a room and we locked the room and nobody was supposed to go in there, but I snuck in and I grabbed a pile of these written down teachings and I took them down to Kinko's and I printed them all out and I put them in a nice, nice uh, binded situation and I would read them and I still have them and I still read them and I still like to position myself at a desk or lying on the bed, calmly breathe, calmly relax, and then just start reading through these teachings and not thinking about them too much, not chewing over them, not, not trying to do that thing that sometimes we do when we're reading spiritual texts, which is to pause and to look at ourselves and to say, do I believe this? Do I think this? Am I living up to this teacher's words? How can I take this? this beautiful enlightened person's teachings and swallow it, digest it, and make it my own inner life. I just contemplate. So it's a calmer, more relaxed, more generous approach to reading and digesting materials. It's like you're, you're with a child that you love, playing in silence. You're making relationship. That's how I try and relate to this text, in a quiet, humble, and simple way holding my teacher's words, contemplating them, not thinking, not chewing them over, not making my mind busy, but focusing on them, concentrating on them. When I do that, those words feed me. Shunryu Suzuki said, we shouldn't read too much, but every once in a while, our brains need food. And that's what I try and do when I'm contemplating when I'm doing the contemplation portion of my lay practice, give my brain some food. Then there's mentoring or Dharma friendship. I've got a great spiritual friend, Keegan Eckeson, who is the uh, abbot of the Bodhidharma Zen Center here. He's been my mentor for many years. He's my spiritual friend now. And I find it helpful to just be able to sit down with him. It's usually spontaneous. I try and make it like twice a month. We'll have a conversation about practice, a conversation about Buddhist principles, kind of a conversation with him about where my practice is at and where his practice is at. It's helpful to not have to carry around the struggles and challenges of your spiritual life all by yourself. It's nice to be able to air them honestly with a practice peer of some kind. And this can take many different forms. A lot of people don't have practice peers. They don't even have a, a sitting group in town where they can go sit. So maybe you do it online. Maybe you've got, you're leaving comments in a comment section on a video like this and people interact with you. It's good to tell your mind that you're a practitioner, that you're on a spiritual path, that you do zazen or meditation and one way to tell yourself this is to share it with people and get feedback, right? It, it keeps your pra I found it keeps my practice alive. There are things that I don't see about myself or about Zen practice or about life that a spiritual friend, my spiritual friend, helps, helps show me. And the third thing is meditation. This is Third and probably the most basic, most foundational part of my lay practice. Now, I was taught that when you sit, you give yourself to the breath. And when you do that, the self dissolves completely. And there's nobody there sitting on the cushion. We all know how this is. You're not thinking. You're doing, you're gone. Self, ego, dead, out of the picture, kaput, okay? 
I've found this to be harder to do in my lay practice. And there's a reason for that. Like, when you go to a monastery, you spend hours, days, months, years meditating. And, and everything you're doing in the grounds is meditation. You begin to develop a zazen state of mind. But a lay life is much busier. So a lot of the time, I find, when I sit down to do my sitting practice, a ton, a volcano of emotions and thoughts and worries and moments of joy, beauty, love, anxiety, depression, fear, all this stuff explodes to the surface because I haven't had a chance to let it come up. I've been too busy, right? And I find a lot of the times that if I really try and ignore all that and focus on my breath, my body starts to feel strange. My body and my chest, it starts to feel a kind of anxiety, a kind of like, almost like my body is crying out and it's like a kid and it's saying, pay attention to me, pay attention. My mind is saying, pay attention. So I've begun to develop almost more of a Soto or a Shikan Taza type practice, just sitting, just sitting. Now, when I'm really distracted and I feel like I'm wasting my time, I bring that attention back to the breath because the breath is my North Star. It's, it's my sail in the wind. I'm a Rinzai Zen monk and I know what to do and how to do it. And when I'm really lost on the cushion, I bring all my attention back to the breath and I really focus and you dissolve that panicking, thinking, stressed out mind. But there's also a part of me now and it's becoming more part of my sitting practice as a lay practitioner of just sitting and whatever happens within that 10 minute or 20 minute or 30 minute period of sitting, it varies for me, is zazen, is meditation. Let it come up. This is a really important part of my lay practice now. A subtle but, but necessary shift from a very samurai zen approach to meditation in preparation for koan practice with my teacher and life as a lay practitioner with a lot going on, job, relationship, bills, etc. And letting all of my life come up and be with me on the cushion, not indulging my thinking mind not stepping back and watching the thinking mind do its thing, not pushing thinking thoughts, feelings out of the way, but letting it all come up and dissolve, come up and dissolve like the weather, not getting caught up in any of it, not focusing on any of it, just sitting with it, sitting with it all. Sitting with the pain, sitting with the fear, sitting with the joy, just sitting, letting it come, letting it go. Just like the inhale and the exhale, come and go, come and go. I'm finding what's really, really important for me as a lay practitioner is to let go of expectation and let go of guilt, right? Because if my sitting practice becomes one more thing I have to do in a life that is like chock full of responsibilities, I'm not going to do it or I'm going to have to willpower my way onto the cushion. So remember what I said, your life is now your Zen practice. My life is my Zen practice and my Zen practice, my life needs support. So meditation, Zazen, when I sit down to do it, it's got to support that. And if I'm forcing myself to do it and hammering myself for not doing it right and then feeling guilty when I don't do it long enough or don't do it consistently enough or don't do it right enough. None of that works. Try not to beat yourself up. Like, 
develop an intimacy and a connection with your practice. I talked about this last week. Make it you-sized. Make it tailor-cut to fit your body, your life, your mind, your character. It's not something you have to do. It's something you want to do. And it's something you become. You become a wandering monk. And I think it's really a beautiful thing to be. You're on your path. Speaking of paths, if you're enjoying what you see on this channel, which is sort of my path right now, sharing my insights and practice tips with you. I've got a PayPal link and a Patreon link in the video description below. You can support me there. I appreciate it. Over on Patreon, I've got all kinds of essays and videos and stuff. Also, if you can hit the subscribe, hit the like button, and maybe even hit the notification button, that will help me get to a thousand subscribers on this channel. When that happens, I'm going to film my levitation live and my paranirvana. I'm going to leave this form and transcend into the heavens. Get me to a thousand view uh, subscribers, and we can all watch this happen together. Booyah!